Tick tock, time to rock. Good evening, good morning, good afternoon to everyone who's watching from all around the world. I'm your friendly neighborhood philosopher, David Wood, and with me now is your friendly neighborhood. What are you? Theologian? What do you call yourself? What yeah, you? uh, I'm an aspiring systematic theologian who takes uh, philosophy very seriously. And in fact, I say that philosophy is my favorite hobby. That is pretty much the nerdiest thing I've ever heard in my entire <laughs> life. All right. What can I say? <laughs> well, as you can see from the topic, we're going to be talking about free will. We're going to be talking about determinism. We're going to talk about worldviews that include determinism, worldviews that include free will. Um, so we'll be talking about Calvinism. We'll be talking about Molinism. We'll be talking about all these kinds of things. And uh, I don't study these things a tremendous amount when I, uh, I used to teach philosophy of human nature. So um, I had to talk about the main, uh, the main views um, dealing with, uh, you know, as far as the, the, the main three options in as far as philosophical determinism or physical determinism. You've got, uh, you've got libertarian free will. You've got what's called hard determinism. And then you have what's called soft determinism or compatibilism. Keep in mind that the don't take soft determinism as 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 meaning less deterministic. They're every bit as deterministic. They just uh, disagree with hard determinists on the implications. So the philosophical the philosophical positions. The hard determinists believe that every every decision you make is is physically determined. Right? It's particles in motion. You are. Uh, everything that you that you've ever done, you were determined to do. You could not have done otherwise, right? So hard determinists believe that, and they the implication that they hold to is that uh, you're not actually morally responsible for your actions. You can still punish people as a deterrent, but they 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 believe hey, you're not you're not actually responsible. You couldn't have done otherwise. Uh, the compatibilists compatibilists they believe that you're determined, just like. Uh, just like the hard determinists, but they believe it, it's actually compatible. It's actually compatible with moral responsibility and, and uh, some kind of freedom. And then you have the libertarians who believe that you are actually capable of doing other than what you do, right? That there are situations you're in in which you could actually, there's more than one option. So you're not actually determined by physical causes. Uh, so we're going to be talking a little bit about this, but not so much in those in those philosophical categories as uh, this would be more theological, right? Uh, we're going to dip our toes into some philosophy, too, and uh, discuss those definitions. I think I'm going to provide a little bit of nuance. You know, uh, your new friend, Jonathan Thompson, and I were uh, talking the other day, and, uh, you know, he noted that oftentimes uh, even philosophers will have a certain definition of free will in mind, and uh, the other one will have a different definition, and you'll just talk right past each other. Yeah. And no progress is made. And so, uh, yeah, we want to really define what we mean by these terms. Yeah. And so, uh, you know, a libertarian is, is meaning freedom in the sense that, you know, uh, it, you have freedom to do one thing or you have freedom to do the other. And you, you could actually do both, depending on what's that. Actually, there's another way to look at it, too, libertarian freedom. And that is simply if you are the source of your thoughts or and or actions if you're the source and nothing else is you have no external causes mm -hmm. you know causing or determining you to think or act a certain way then it could be said even if for some weird reason you couldn't do otherwise it could still be said that you possess libertarian freedom but with that said the definition of uh, I mean, let me say that i do affirm that definition the source of definition um but i also I also like to argue that oftentimes that you possess an ability to choose between a range of options, each compatible with your nature. And if that's true, then you have libertarian freedom as well. Do or do you adhere to to PAP? I do. The actually. principle of alternative yeah. possibilities. By the way, yeah. we will explain everything we're talking about right now. <laughs> we're just we're just chatting here at the beginning right to right. set things up. We'll take a few comments while people filter in. And usually it's about the first 15 mm -hmm. minutes or so as people are filtering in when they see the notification yeah. pop up that, that we're live. In fact, if uh why don't you check real quick? See yeah. if uh see if uh See if One Minute Apologist is still is, is live. Yeah, see if he's live on his channel. If he is, I'm going to troll him, and I'm going to say, hey, everyone, why don't you come over to a much better uh -huh. live stream? 
And uh, I think he's on there with Inspiring Philosophy. So you've what? got One Minute Apologists and Inspiring Philosophy live. They were live uh, like 50 minutes ago. Right. So yeah, just type in One Minute Apologist. Little side note here. Maybe I'll take a couple comments from Cook. Um, <laughs> this is funny. Um, we've got uh, you've got some people who are interested in Molinism. That's going to be Who's good that? because you're. Are they live? Uh, let's see. Skip ad. They are live. Yeah, they are. They are live. Uh, go ahead and type there. David Wood says. <laughs> David Wood says, "Come over to our much better. Come over to our much better live stream on my channel." Act <laughs> uh, seventeen, Act seventeen apologetics. All right, we had to get that out of the way. We, I like to start off my live streams by uh, trolling somebody. Um. <laughs> all right, so we got we we got that out of the way. Um, so we have someone here who's uh, interested in Molinism. We have Muhammad here. Who asks what the Bible's position is on this? I'm glad and, you asked. And Muhammad, that's a, that's actually going to be an interesting discussion because um, uh, in the Quran, in the Quran, you have uh, you, you have a similar issue in that there's a dispute, and uh, Sunni Muslims tend to lean more towards uh, determinism of everything, and and Shias tend to uh, to to be more libertarian in their views but there's a debate even though i'd say there are passages of the quran that are pretty darn clear um but it's similar in christianity because you have in the bible you have passages that, that sound like that sound like determinism like the, some sort of theological determinism that sound like god is uh controlling everything um so you know the hair of your head won't fall to the ground things like that think god is controlling even these little mm -hmm. tiny things um but other 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 passages sound like we certainly have the freedom to to make a choice and that God is holding us responsible for for the choice that we make. So, yep, but we've got some this, we've got some issues here. Does the Quran teach that Allah controls thoughts and beliefs? Yeah, I would say that it does. Mm -hmm. uh, we could have us. We could have, I, I could do a live stream on that and yeah, uh, bring up and go through all the passages and stuff. But, yeah, cool. I'd like to I'd like to see that. Yeah, but we'll talk about some of that later today. Tonight. Um, Actually, here. Um, <clears throat> Peanut here says, can you guys give life examples to go with each definition? All right, let's go through the position. I'll, I'll mention the positions as, as I understand them, the, the basic positions. And you can tell me uh, right or wrong or if you, you want to add to, to these, okay, right? Okay. So you've got libertarians, as far as, far as the main positions within Christianity, right? You've got uh, libertarianism. Break down libertarianism for us. Mm -hmm. Just, just ignore my principle of alternative possibilities and things like that. Break down libertarianism for us, and then determinism. And then within, within those, there, there are going to be multiple positions that would include uh, libertarian freedom, and they have different views of what God knows, uh, what kind of knowledge yeah. God has. So uh, libertarianism, why don't you break that down for everyone? Me? No, wait, 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 no. Before, okay. before we do any of that, before we do any of that, so we are going to go through these. Uh, first... Let's talk about why this is important, ah. right? Because, you know, I normally deal with like Islam and basic <laughs> apologetics. And here we are talking about uh, issues that philosophers deal with and theologians deal with. And you've got um, open theism and, and classical Arminianism and Molinism and Calvinism and these different positions. Right. And you've got people like me who, who don't even have any sort of firm position because I've never thought oh, I, I really need to study this for a long time to put your foot field. down. Yeah. yeah. So why should we why should people um why should people pay attention to this issue? Why should it, why should we think this is important? Well let me give a few Because uh, you think it's very important. I do for several okay. reasons. Yeah. So let me fly over some of these reasons. Uh number one, for Christians I think it's uh it's important because I believe it's a it's a biblical concept that libertarian freedom is uh, taught or at least heavily implied in scripture. Uh, I think we can look at Deuteronomy. We can look at all the passages that talk about, uh, you know, self-control or self-examination, uh, things like that. But 
Um, I, I like to start with 1 Corinthians 10, 13. You know, Paul is clear in that passage that every time, at least for Christians, right? At least for Christians, if the Christian is tempted to sin, God promises to provide a way of escape. Well, I know that as a Christian, I still sin. I know David does it very often, um, but maybe occasionally. So what follows from that is every time that Dave sins or I sin, um, God provided a way of escape, uh, an ability to do otherwise even. So that's a uh, stronger than the sourcehood uh, view of libertarian freedom that I was talking about earlier. Um, so yeah, every time that I sin as a Christian, there was a way of escape available for me and I failed to take it. Therefore, I'm responsible. So I can't say uh, the devil made me do it. And I definitely better not say God made me do it when I sin. Uh, I'm responsible uh, because I, I'm able not to sin because God has given me a way of escape. And because I was able and I failed, now I'm response able uh, for my sins, uh, for falling into temptation. So that's just one example of libertarian freedom <clears throat> uh, implied in scripture. Uh, the next uh, that I'd say uh, another reason why it's important is because I believe if uh, humanity does not possess uh, libertarian freedom, uh, that perfect being theology is eventually going to fall apart. Um, I can unpack that later a bit more. Um, the third reason, uh, ultimately, if uh, humans possess libertarian free will, it can be used as an apologetic to point towards the existence of God. And I'll talk about that later. Um, the fourth reason why libertarian freedom or libertarian free will is important is because it makes morality possible. The fifth reason uh, that libertarian freedom is important is it makes rationality possible and thus uh, knowledge gained via rationality possible. Um, the sixth reason is that life seems to be meaningless and purposeless and unimportant if uh, we don't possess libertarian freedom. Uh, if everything is causally determined, uh, you know, the uh, many naturalists and atheists would say that all things are causally determined basically by physics and chemistry or the forces of nature. Uh, well, if that's the case, then uh, everything I think and do and everything that you think and do is causally determined. It's not up to you. Uh, it's up to physics and chemistry uh, and the forces of nature. And if that's the case, then life seems to be meaningless. So, that, you know, and unimportant. And that's another reason why I think libertarian freedom is important. Um, what else? Oh, well, I think uh, uh, for, for theists and Christians especially, I think uh, libertarian free will is important because it uh, provides a, a defense or a, a way to uh, destroy, if you will, the greatest objection raised against the greatest being. Uh, the problem of evil and i believe that you can appeal to free will to um, uh, defeat the moral problem of evil the natural problem of evil uh, seemingly gratuitous uh, problems of evil and really etc there's a i think there's many ways in fact i'm working on a journal article right now i'm not you know a little teaser um, even how this can uh, help us answer problems related to divine hiddenness I won't get into the details there tonight because uh, I'm still working on that article. Um, but yeah, finally, I think the eighth reason, I think I'm on number eight, uh, is that uh, libertarian free will um, makes it possible to experience true love. Uh, so I've written a lot about that. So yeah, those are at least eight reasons. There's probably more. But yeah, I'd say it's, uh, it's, it's a biblical concept. It, it's vital when it comes to apologetics. In fact, I'd say it's relate, highly related to much of the cumulative case of apologetics, you know, the, the cumulative case that Dr. Craig and other philosophers like him uh, offer, and uh, even more arguments that many people aren't aware of. So it's important for many reasons. All right, uh, Tatiana says, uh, this is complicated. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, it can be complicated, but sometimes it's good to, to think through complicated things, but uh, the, the, the core issues, um, anyone can get these. It, it, it'll, it'll especially be complicated if you're, if you're going through this for the first time. But, but just think about this, right? Um, if the physical world is all that exists, right? So if the physical world here, so here's the sort of problems in, in the, in the different contexts. If the physical world is all that exists, and all that exists are things like particles and uh, energy and things like that, 
And these are all governed by uh, just laws, laws of nature. Then the, the idea, which goes back several centuries, is that if, if you kind of knew every, the position of every particle and every direction it's going and so on, you could, you could predict anything that would ever, that would ever happen in the, in the future, right? But um, if, the, if, we, if all we are is sort of particles in motion, and those particles are controlled by, governed by, laws of nature, then all your thoughts really are is, is particles in motion and things like mm -hmm. that. And if they're just following the laws of nature, then every thought you've ever had is what we call determined, right? It's determined. It, it, couldn't, it couldn't be anything else, right? It, it, it has to happen. Given the causes that came before it, there's only, there's only one possible outcome here, right? So uh, you have the causes, the causes, the causes were in place before you were born. So every decision you've ever made was, you say, causally determined by what came before it, right? So that seems to flow from a view of the universe, which views everything as just as just physical in, in nature. Now, if you're a Christian, if you're a Christian, then you also most likely believe in a soul, and you certainly would have to believe in God. So now you believe that there is more than just the physical world. There's more than just particles in motion, right? There's something like the soul, which would not be physical. Uh, there's the, you have God, who's not physical. So you've got something else in play here. So that would seem to free up uh, a lot of human for the possibility of human freedom that that our decisions, our choices are not simply causally determined by what happened before. But, but you, one, you, you could in theory still believe that your decisions are, 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 are determined by physical causes, right? You could just, you know, God lets our, our thoughts and so on be controlled by, by these physical causes. Um, but re regardless, even if you wanted to lay that aside, you could believe that God determines everything that happens. In other words, every decision you make, including your decision on whether to believe in God or believe in the gospel, that God is causing those decisions, right? And so basically a couple different categories. You can believe in physical determinism. In other words, once you have the, the certain causes in place, there's what happens is the only thing that could happen, right? Um, you can believe in physical determinism. You could believe in some sort of theological determinism where God is determining things. Uh, but it ultimately means that given the, the causes that came well before you, these are the only things that could happen. These are the only decisions you could make. Um, so you can believe that. Or you can believe what's called compatibilism, right? So, so if, if you were some sort of hard determinist or uh, a hard determinist is, is someone who's an incompatibilist. He doesn't believe that um, that determinism is compatible with the kind of free will that would give us moral responsibility. So he's an incompatibilist in that sense, but he's also a determinist. Uh, libertarianism, usually, usually the libertarian is going to be an incompatibilist. He doesn't believe that, uh, that the kind of freedom that's necessary for moral responsibility is compatible with determinism. Uh, but he believes we're not determined, he believes we're not determined. And so we have uh, and, and that we have we, we do have this kind of freedom. But anyway, you don't need to learn. You don't need to get all these terms. Just try and get the main ideas down. Right. If you are a determinist, you believe that all our decisions are determined. The first question is going to be, do you believe that you can be genuinely morally responsible for your decisions or rationally responsible or rationally uh, morally or rationally responsible for your decisions and your beliefs if every decision and belief that you have you had to have it you had to have it and it was caused by someone or something else caused by something causes well beyond you either god or the physical world so that's gonna be, your answer to that question is going to put you in a category uh and then the the second sort of issue would be um, do you believe that we're determined, right? So do you believe, so if you believe you're, we're, we're determined, do you believe that's compatible with, uh, you know, moral and rational, uh, accountability, um, or not? And the other question is if, whether you believe that you're determined, right? So do you believe that when you make a decision that you, you had to make that decision either because God determined, he destined you to make that decision or because the physical world does? So basically, mm -hmm. these are there. There are only a few. There are a few basic categories here, right? There's, there are only a few different answers to these kinds of questions, and so. But these things can have some. Our answers to these questions can have some profound 
uh, implications for our theology, for our view of God, for our view of uh, God, the relationship between uh, God and, and human suffering, um, our view of, of our own moral responsibility, all kinds of things. So that's why we're talking. That's why we're talking about that. We'll, we'll try to break everything down. You won't. You know. You you might not get terms that we're using if you're, especially again, if you're hearing from, hearing them from for the first time. If if Tim explains libertarianism or something like that, you it, you may take a while to get. But you can. Everyone should be able to get these these basic ideas. All right. What are your thoughts here? Uh, I could read a couple quotes that might help people understand uh, what's going on here. Okay. Um, so Sam Harris, uh, one of the leading atheists out there uh, today, is called uh, one of the four horsemen of, uh, what, what was he? Uh, the, I don't know, the four horsemen, horsemen of the atheist the apocalypse atheist or something or, yeah, like that. Something yeah, something like that. Yeah. Whatever. Yeah. Um, so Sam Harris is a, a naturalistic atheist, right? He believes that the only thing that exists is uh, scientifically testable stuff, I believe. Um, and so if, if that's the case, he believes that everything is, everything about you is causally determined by basically, like I said, by physics and chemistry or the forces of nature or something like that. So here's what he says in his book entitled Free Will. He says, quote, free will is an illusion. Our wills are simply not of our own making. And then he says, thoughts, right? Our very thoughts and intentions emerge from background causes of which we are unaware and over which we exert no conscious control. We do not have the freedom we think we have. Either our wills are determined by prior causes and we are not responsible for them, or they are the product of chance and we are not responsible for them." End quote. So that's how the atheistic naturalists typically, or, or a whole bunch of them, they, they believe that way, right? I would say, most atheistic naturalists that I talk to are going to hold that view or something similar. Now, there's also uh, theological determinists who believe that God causally determines everything. In fact, I used to be one of those guys. I, uh, for years, I affirmed what I call exhaustive divine determinism. Right Now, this is a view that many, not all, but many Calvinists hold. Exhaustive divine determinism. And you can remember that by Ed, right? E-D-D. -D. Um, uh, one of uh, Dave's friends, and I met him before, great guy, uh, you might help me with his name, Guillaume Mignon, did I say it right? That's, that's, that's pretty good. Pretty good? All right. How's my French? Good. Right. Oh, and by the way, where's Guillaume here? We got some guy who's going to be, who's going to be defending Molinism, huh? Where are the Calvinists at, huh? By the way, just so you guys know, uh, a lot of my friends, a lot of the guys I, I normally work with. Uh, they're great guys. Calvinists. But they're Calvinists. We're reformed. So you're talking vocab alone? I am reformed. Talking. There's not a Calvinist. Voc I'm a zero point Calvinist. What? <laughs> we got vocab Malone. We got Anthony Rogers. We got Guillaume Bignon. We got Paul Rescala. These guys are all in that Calvinist reform category. Where are they at? Tim's here. <laughs> Tim's here putting his position out there. Where are they to give a response? Nowhere. Starting to think, man, yeah. <laughs> man, maybe they're, maybe they're a little man. scared. Uh -oh. hey, Dave's trying to start fights. <laughs> I'm here to try to build some bridges, but you know, we'll see what happens. <laughs> I'm not here to burn bridges. Just, you know, just here to have a good conversation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But uh, yeah, I've talked to a lot of those guys that you mentioned. Great guys. I, I love talking to them. And that's the great thing about doing theology with brothers and sisters in Christ. I love disagreeing with people because, man, that's how iron sharpens iron. And I'm willing to be wrong. You know, I, man, I used to be a Calvinist and I left that camp. I was convinced that I was wrong. I'm willing to come back. Convince me. All right. But um, let's talk about these exhaustive divine determinists, which, like I said, many, maybe the majority of Calvinists, uh, would affirm that view. I used to affirm that view. Not only was I a five-point Calvinist, but I affirmed exhaustive divine determinism, that God caused and determined everything, either directly or indirectly, in some form or fashion. But uh, Guignon says this in his book. He says, quote, Do the five points of Calvinism, or the Westminster Confession, necessitate the thesis of theological determinism? I assert that they do. It will be so as a matter of definition, Theological determinism, or EDD, will be referred to as the Calvinistic view, or simply Calvinism, end quote. And uh, in addition, let me get my notes together here. 
In addition, um, the Calvinist Matthew J. Hart, in his recent essay, uh, wrote something similar, quote, Calvinists, I shall assume, are theological determinists. They hold that God causes every contingent event, either directly or indirectly. And uh, so really, uh, atheistic naturalists and exhaustive divine determinists, they hold the same view, but for different reasons, right? Something other than you causes and determines everything about you. And uh, yeah, Dave, as we were talking about earlier, really that's kind of the Islamic view too, especially when it comes to thinking that, that Allah uh, causes and determines everybody's thoughts. Now, would that be true, do you think, all the time or just occasionally? Or uh, You mean from an Islamic perspective? Yeah, from the uh, Islamic uh, perspective. I mean, certainly on the, on the big issues. Um, uh, so, for instance, in the... Uh, you, you find you find this throughout the Quran, but I mean it, it becomes very very clear uh, as well in in the Hadith. There's a story um, where Adam and Moses have a little argument, and Moses points to Adam. Moses points to Adam and says, "You're the cause of all this suffering." And Adam says, "Why are you blaming me for something that God determined I would oh, do really? long before I was born?" Wow. Yeah. So it's, you can't blame. Notice it, it, he's saying, "Don't blame me." Don't blame me for what I've done. So I mean, that's almost hey, you, you're not morally responsible for what yeah. you did because you were because you were determined to do it. So interesting stuff, uh, interesting stuff there. So guys, there are uh, um, these two these these couple of categories, right? If you are a if you're a libertarian, right? If you're a libertarian, you believe that you have a certain kind of freedom, which normally includes normally includes the ability to do otherwise. So alternative possibilities. But at uh, least but also at least you are the you are the source of yeah, your actions source. in the sense that it was not determined by something a, apart from you or, be, or 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 before you is that is that correct? That's yeah, I mean I, I've got here uh, in one of my articles on my website at freethinkingministries.com. You know, I'm really focused on but what's more important to me when I'm arguing for free will isn't that I have the freedom to raise my right hand. Uh, I think that's important, but what's more important for me, what I do uh, most of my work focusing on is the freedom to think. And so that's why we're called free thinking ministries. Mm -hmm. And I like to show the atheists who like to call themselves free thinkers don't have logical access to that term. Yeah. We, we, do, do we want to address that now? Because I think that's massively important. Do we want to address right. that now or, or yeah. later? Because it's a... Uh, well, so first, let me, let me just break down the positions I was, I was mentioning. So, okay. so, so the, the important categories for these, dis these discussions usually, right? Is one or one whether whether you're a libertarian or or a determinist. If you're a libertarian, we're talking about in the theological sense now. Uh, so we're we're talking about the relationship between actions and God, right? Um, actions and ch decisions and cho choices, things like that. Those things and God. What's the what's the relationship? So if you are a libertarian and you believe that God knows the past and the present but not the future, then you're an open theist, mm -hmm. right? If you're a libertarian and you believe that God knows the past and the present and the future, but not counterfactuals, that's sort of classical Arminianism. Uh, if you are a libertarian and you believe that God knows the past, the present and the future and counterfactuals and can use all of that, all of that knowledge, then you're in the Molinist category. I gotta stop you right there. You gotta back it up and say God would possess that knowledge uh, logically prior, if that gets confusing, that God had that knowledge prior to his creative decree. Mm -hmm. right. But he but he knows past, present, future. Yeah, and counterfactuals. And counterfactuals. But he also knew those counterfactuals. I, I like to say it like this. Before God created, right? did God know everything he could do and did God know everything that would happen based off of everything he could have done? Now, if that's true, in that state that we're talking about before creation, then God's got middle knowledge. Mm -hmm. right. So uh, we can unpack that more as we go on, I think. And so those are based on if you're a libertarian and then what kind of knowledge you believe God has, then you're going to be in, you're going to be in, that's going to determine your character. You know, I mean, the category you're in right there. And then if you're, if you're not a libertarian, you're a determinist, 
You believe that that we are all determined, all our all our thoughts and actions are determined by God. Then Caused and determined. Yeah. yeah. Then you're going to be in the uh, most likely be in the the Calvinist category. Is there anyone else who? Besides but, but there are some Calvinists who reject that exhaustive divine determinist view and uh, uh, that affirm what I like to call limited libertarian freedom. Others might call it soft libertarian freedom, but uh, limited libertarian freedom, limited to some things some of the time. So you can be a five point Calvinist and still affirm a limited libertarian freedom. My friend Greg Kokel with Stand to Reason Ministries is a great example. Uh, Greg in his book Tactics does a fantastic job of arguing uh, for what is libertarian freedom when it comes to rationality. He points that, uh, that you're not free to think, but one of, you know, something that I love to argue for, that, um, that there, there's rationality problems there. And so of course, we've got to have libertarian freedom. There can't be something causally determining all of my thoughts and beliefs all the time. Otherwise, I'm not rationally responsible. And so, but he still affirms five-point Calvinism. And so he's a, a five-point Calvinist who also believes in libertarian freedom some of the times, just not in things related to salvation issues. So when it comes to soteriology, which soteriology just means salvation issues, uh, when it comes to salvation, uh, guys like Greg and other Calvinists like that will say, no, everything is determined. But in these other issues, yeah, you've got free will. And I, and I contend in my dissertation, uh, I offered quotes from Calvin and Luther and Melanchthon that would support that exact same position. Now, I, sometimes I think those guys talked out of, at least Calvin and Luther talked out of both sides of their mouth. Um, but but there's they definitely have quotes which affirm limited libertarian freedom. And Melanchthon was clear uh, that, that we possess uh, this ability. And remember, uh, basically what I mean by Limited libertarian freedom. Well, let me let me read the definitions of libertarian freedom here that I've got in front of me. Um, libertarian freedom can be most simply defined as a rejection of compatibilism, along with the claim that humans at least occasionally possess free will. So we'll start with that. Uh, Dave talked a little bit about compatibilism. Now I can nuance that a little bit, but I'll bracket that and talk about it later. Uh, so that is to say that the advocate of libertarian freedom affirms that we possess freedom of moral and rational responsibility and that the freedom necessary for responsible action is not compatible with determinism. Uh, to keep it simple, it's vital to grasp that the libertarian freedom or that libertarian freedom sometimes refers to an ability to do or think otherwise, but it always refers to source agency with no external causes. So that's that sourcehood freedom we were talking about. With that said, for me, I personally like to argue for a stronger model of libertarian freedom. That is to say, most of the time, when I refer to libertarian freedom, I simply mean what most people probably think of when they use the term free will. Simply put, libertarian freedom is the ability to choose between or among a range of alternative options, each of which is compatible with one's nature. So. Yeah, I, I affirm compatibilism in a sense. I, of course, we can't do anything that's not compatible with our nature, but I believe that uh, we have many good reasons, including biblical reasons, to to see that there are sometimes several things which are compatible with human nature, or what I like to call an image of God nature. But yeah, that's uh, that's what I mean by libertarian freedom. And Andrew Martin here said, uh, and thank you, uh, anyone who's uh, telling us when we're using a term and we haven't fully explained it or uh, you missed it. But uh, Andrew Martin says, uh, what are counterfactuals? So I mentioned counterfactuals and uh, God, uh, God has knowledge of counterfactuals. Uh, counterfactual state of affairs is um, it's basically God knows what free decision a person existent or non-existent would make in certain situations. So to give you to give you a, a biblical example of a of a counterfactual, right? Um, in when you had uh, the, the 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 fighting between David and Saul, right, where Saul was trying to kill <coughs> David, uh, David, uh, this, is, this is the famous example that's used of a counterfactual. Uh, but David asks uh, asks through the prophet, um, if I go up to Kila will will Saul come there, and then God re replies to the prophet, "Yes, he's going. To, he's going to come up there, right?" So David doesn't go there. Now notice notice what happens. David never actually goes there, right? 
but God knows what Saul would do if David did go there, right? So a counterfactual is basically, if you think about it, just break it down in simpler terms, right? Does God know what I would do if he put me in the 1700s in the middle of, you know, some war battle or something like that? Does God know what I would do if I were put into completely different circumstances than I'm actually in right now? Uh, if you say yes, then then you're saying that God uh, has this extra kind of knowledge and that he knows counterfactual, I mean, uh, counter to fact, right? So the fact is I'm not there, right? I'm not there. What if I were? What if I were in that situation? Would God know what I would do in that situation? So the idea is before God created anything, right? Before God created anything, does God know what every possible being that he could create would do in various circumstances that they were in that's that's a that's a certain kind of knowledge i'm sure you have more to add to that yeah i i mean to keep it simple and to boil it down i just like to say that counterfactual knowledge is god's what if knowledge mm -hmm. you know what would happen if you know so uh clearly uh god has counterfactual knowledge um if you read scripture uh, like they they've gave an awesome example so the question then is, does God possess this counterfactual knowledge prior to his creative decree? Um, <clears throat> and uh, and that's, a, that's the big question. I think he does. I think you got to say, if we're committed to God's omniscience and his maximal greatness, uh, then, then he does. So if God is maximally great, uh, logically prior to his creative decree, um, and, if, and if open theism is false, then I believe... Uh, uh, then some flavor of Molinism is going to be true. <clears throat> but, but I think for a while, let's just focus on, on the importance of free will. And should I we wanted, talk about that a little bit? Well, I wanted to focus on this atheist issue. Oh, yeah, real right, quick. Right, right. Uh, so, guys, it's uh, because you, you mentioned, you know, you mentioned that, that atheists have a problem with, with calling themselves free thinkers, right? Right. Um, so, if, if, if anyone hasn't been around or hasn't uh, interacted with many atheists, atheists love to refer to themselves as free thinkers, right? And what do they, what do they mean by that? Well, you know, we're, we're the ones who are in chains, whereas they're the ones who are thinking freely and they freely recognize that there is no God because they're not, you know, bound in their beliefs like, like we are. And the reason that uh, Tim and I both find that so ridiculous, right, is um, atheists are typically are typically naturalists, right? They believe the natural world is all that exists. And so if the natural world is all that exists and all we are is, is particles in motion and all that, you know, our thoughts are, are some sort of chemical sloshing around governed by natural laws, straightforward cause and effect. Everything is determined. Every decision you make is determined. How are your thoughts free, right? Every, every thought you've had as an atheist, including your decision to uh, believe in atheism, adhere to atheism, reject the existence of God, reject Christianity. All of those decisions were completely, utterly, totally under the control of particles in motion that was, you know, all your thoughts were determined before you were even born, right? <clears throat> so the mm -hmm. theist who remains a theist his entire life, he believes in God his entire life. If atheism is true, if naturalism specifically is true, then that's all that person could have ever believed all his life. If a person becomes an atheist and this sort of determinism is true, then that's all that person was, was, that's all the person was going to do, right? So in what sense are you more free than anyone else? How are you the free thinker in all of this? You, you were, your thoughts, your thoughts were all determined. Every last one of them down to the, down to the most minute thought you've ever had was all determined long before you were born. You could never have thought anything other than what you've thought. How are you free? So just to, to, to have that worldview of naturalism and then to go around saying that you're the free thinker is, uh, I think, beyond ridiculous. But what are your, what are your thoughts? Well, let this? me give you the, a problem with that. Uh, now, this is going to spill over into the, uh, the exhaustive divine determinist view, too, and show why this is a problem. But, uh, but Nate, you know, when I, like, when I talk to atheistic naturalists who say, yeah, everything's determined, you don't have free will, you know, I like to say this, uh, I, I like to give a thought experiment. And I say, suppose a mad scientist somehow got control of your brain. And so he uh, is now able to causally determine everything uh, you think. Everything you think about your beliefs and all of your beliefs about your thoughts, 
this guy causally determines exactly what you think of and about and exactly how you think of and about it. He causally determines all your thoughts and all your beliefs all the time and he even causally determines the next words that are going to come out of your mouth. Question. How can you, not the mad scientist, rationally affirm any one of your thoughts or beliefs? Good luck with that. It's impossible. You don't stand in a, in a position to rationally affirm anything because whatever comes out of your mouth isn't from you. It's from the mad scientist. And so if you replace the mad scientist with physics and chemistry, you got the same problem, but for different reasons. And I say if you replace the mad scientist with God, you've got the same problems but for different reasons. And so, yeah, what's the story about when Allah, uh, so I think you were talking about this with uh, Mike last night, uh, with Mike Lacona, that Allah caused Muslims to hold false beliefs, is that right? Oh, and, well, he, well, he, he, it, that wasn't causal in the same way of, of, of affecting all their thoughts, but he, he gave Muhammad a dream convincing him that the, the approaching army was small and that the Muslims would easily defeat them. And so, but it was false. The army was, was much, was much, was three times larger than the Muslim army. So Allah gave Muhammad a dream leading him into a false belief. And then Muhammad, he comes up and says, oh guys, uh, just so you know, the, the army approaching is small. And so they go out and do what, what he wants. And so, uh, yeah, that was, that was about Allah. Well, okay, well, deception. what was it with the, the Muslims believe that the original disciples were actually Muslims? Yep. Is that, but then he caused them to hold false beliefs. Uh, well, it, you, you have to put it, you have to put it together because okay. the Quran just said the Quran, according to the, to the Quran and sort of classical uh, Islamic belief, um, Jesus didn't die on the cross. Allah miraculously disguised someone else to make mm -hmm. him look like Jesus. And this other person was uh, crucified in Jesus place. So that's, yeah. that's, that's standard Islamic belief. But the Quran says that Jesus' followers were Muslims. They confess that they're Muslims. So the disciples of Jesus who are following him around, they're Muslims. But you, you, you have to kind of put that together with, well, we know that the disciples of Jesus believed in his, his death on the cross. So the question is, according to Islam, where would they have gotten that view? They got it from Allah because Allah is the one who tricked people into believing that Jesus died on the cross. So mm -hmm. basically Allah is the one who's responsible for Christianity. So Muslims point yeah. to the apostle Paul and say, he corrupted Christianity or the council of Nicaea and they corrupted Christianity. No, according to Islam, Allah corrupted Christianity. There was the message of Jesus and then Allah corrupted it with this by convincing so many people, including Jesus' own followers, that Jesus died on the cross. And so yeah. Christianity couldn't have gotten off the ground without that belief, which was a false belief. And where did they get the false belief? They got it from, from Allah. Right. So, so you replace that mad scientist in the thought experiment, experiment with a lot. You got the same problem, but for different reasons. And I contend with Christians that believe that God causes and determines everything exhaustively. Remember that exhaustive divine determinism. You got the same problems. Christians who hold that view have the same problems, the same rationality problems that uh, the Muslims have. And, uh, because, and especially we know this because Christians disagree with each other all the time. Right, so if God is the one that causes and determines this disagreement, uh, he could be causing and determining one person to hold true beliefs and the other to hold false beliefs, but nobody would stand in a position to know who actually is the one that doesn't hold the false beliefs. You could only assume it, but that assumption wouldn't be up to you either. That would be caused and determined by the mad scientist or whatever you're filling the blank in uh, as, the, as the one that's uh, causing and determining everything. So. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, William Lane Craig uh, has discussed this a little bit, and he, and he says, once you realize that even your decision to affirm determinism was determined by something mm -hmm. other than you, a sense of vertigo sets in for everything you think um, yep. is, is caused and determined by something else, and you're not in a position to rationally affirm anything at that point. So yeah. it's, it's very problematic. Yeah, so guys, think about it this way, because we want you to get this point. If you walk away with... with, with I mean, it's basically, we're going to be saying all kinds of things. If you miss some of the points, uh, no problem. Try and get specific, try and get specific points, especially, especially this one right here. Um, if basically, if you're, if you, if you're a naturalist, right, you believe the natural world is all that exists. Uh, our thoughts are, you know, again, chemicals, particles in motion. They're, it's straightforward call, cause and effect, right? The things that you think, 
the things that you're thinking right now are caused by the things that happened right before. And those things were caused by the things that happened right before. And those things are happened by the things that are right before. And that goes back from too long before you were born. So what, what, what uh, Tim is pointing out and that, that Craig has pointed out is once you realize, okay, what's the process that produced my beliefs? You know, it's just particles in motion, right? What's the process that, that, that uh, again, this is assuming that, you know, we have physical determinism. Everything is determined by, you know, physical particles and the laws of nature. Uh, how did Tim arrive at his current thoughts and beliefs? Well, yeah. same thing, exact same process, particles in motion. They just determined him to believe in somewhat different things, right? What's the, what's the cause of the atheist's belief? It's particles in motion. What's the cause of the Hindu's beliefs? Well, particles in motion. Everyone's beliefs have been causally determined by what happened before them. And what that means is, yeah, everyone thinks they're right, but it's the exact same process that produced all these contradictory beliefs. The same process produced all these contradictory beliefs and, uh, and, and causes all these different people to really strictly adhere to their beliefs. How in the name of common sense can you even take your belief in determinism? Seriously, when you know the process that produced it is just particles in motion. And so let, it's let just me, very, very weird. Let me read our friend uh, Greg Kokel's uh, quote from his book, Tactics. He Good says, book. Yeah. He says, the problem with determinism is that without freedom, rationality would have no room to operate. Arguments would not matter since no one would be able to base beliefs on adequate reasons. One could never judge between a good idea and a bad one. One would only hold beliefs because he had been predetermined to do so. Although it's theoretically possible that determinism is true, there is no internal contradiction as far as I can tell. No one could ever know it if it were. Every one of our thoughts, dispositions, and opinions would have been decided for us by factors completely out of our control. Therefore, in practice, Arguments for determinism are self-defeating, end quote. I think he hits the nail on the head with that thing. Mm -hmm. So, and he's a five-point Calvinist. So I just want, want to show you guys here. I mean, Greg and I have argued over Calvinism before, over five-point Calvinism. But at least we agree on this limited libertarian freedom that is vital for rationality, vital for mora morality, vital for love. Um, and ultimately is a powerful apologetic, not just for the existence of God, but I also say for the biblical view of God. We can talk about that more as we go on too. So, All right. A um, couple comments here. Thomas Watkins says, David, is it free thinking in the dictionary? Free thinking equals atheism. And that's sort of the influence on atheism, right? By running around calling themselves the, the free thinkers, mm -hmm. that that became associated with atheism. So the point is, they just, they can't legitimately hold that title about themselves. Right? Yeah, when I went to Biola University and got my master's degree in apologetics there, uh, I did my master's thesis on uh, something called the free thinking argument, something that I uh, kind of came up with there. And I call it the free thinking argument because uh, I was having a lot of arguments with a scientist at the local university where I live. And he's an atheist and he's a ardent determinist. Yet he also led the local free thinkers group, but he would all, always tell me, Tim, you don't have free will. And, uh, but then he would say that he's a free thinker. And I said, wait a second, if there's no free will, there's no free thinking. And I uh, realized that that kind of, you know, he, he really struggled with that. And I started, uh, you know, putting pen to paper and came up with a good argument uh, that, that demonstrates that atheists don't have logical access to that term free thinkers. But I think Christians do, um, not only for, for biblical reasons, but for uh, uh, theological and philosophical reasons. Christians have access to the term free thinking. So I'm taking that, that term back from the atheists because they don't have rights to it. Mm -hmm. and, and we're the ones that have logical rights to it. So yeah, that's I, why I call it free thinking ministries. I feel similarly, although it's not quite the same, but I feel similarly about the about the, the term skeptic, right? Like all these atheists are running around with, with skeptic with their name, right? Yeah. And you ask what they believe about the world and how life formed and all these things. And they're like, 
they're completely gullible with a lot of their beliefs. Now, to be clear, this is not all of them. Some of them will say, you know, I, I don't know how the universe began. I don't know how to believe this. But when you start saying, no, this is how life formed and this is how the world began and stuff like this. And it's, and it's all and 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 I do believe that there is an alternative uh, array, infinite array of universes out there distinct from our own. Um, and you say, what evidence have you been given for that? What evidence have you been given for your view of the origin of life? What evidence have you been given about this? It's clear that they're not applying their skepticism to their own beliefs, right? Mm. So I would say they're not really skeptics. They're they're skeptical of things they don't want to believe. They're skeptical of things they don't want to believe. But as soon as uh, it's something they do want to believe, like let's say, just to give an easy example, uh, if, if, if atheists believe in objective moral values, right? That we have genuine moral responsibilities that aren't some sort of illusion, that weren't just put into us by society, that aren't just hardwiring in our brain, that we actually have moral obligations, objective moral obligations. If an atheist believes in those, well, th he hasn't applied his skepticism uh, in the same way that he applies his skepticism to God. He hasn't done it. So atheists are basically inconsistent skeptics, but guess what? Anyone can be an inconsistent skeptic, right? A Muslim can just believe what he's taught to believe about Islam, but then apply his skepticism to Christianity, right? Anyone can do that. So. Uh, it's basically, it's like a more more along the lines of a Christian, a Christian philosopher, someone like that, who can be skeptical of supernatural claims, right? You can be skeptical right. of supernatural claims, but say, nope, I actually got good evidence here, right? Good evidence but, for that one. But you should also be skeptical of natural claims if they don't make any sense, right? The yeah. atheist, I'm skeptical of supernatural claims, but you can, you can, uh, you know, any any person in a YouTube video can say anything he wants about the origin of life, and it'll just, oh, that that that's how the universe. <laughs> okay, that's how life formed. No yeah. problem. They just believe all these things that they hear in YouTube videos. You're not really, you're not really a skeptic, right? You're you're a uh, you're, you're you're kind of a fake skeptic or an inconsistent skeptic. So yeah, you can be skeptical of supernatural claims. I'm skeptical of supernatural claims, right? Someone says, uh, he says, yeah, you know, I had the flu the other day and, you know, and I prayed and I got better. It's in my mind. Well, maybe that was just your immune system, right? So be skeptical in that sense. Um, but also when, when someone says, this is how the universe formed and, and this is how life formed and it's all these, and this is how we have objective moral values, even though that, uh, that all we are is, is matter. Um, you got to be skeptical of those things too. So, uh, so anyways, I just thought it's a little parallel there that they're taking terms that they should not be using because they actually don't, uh, don't apply to them. Uh, let's take a couple of, uh, questions real quick. Um, so Thomas, uh, Thomas asked the question about free thinking. Yeah. You don't, yeah. Atheists don't get the term free thinking. Yeah. It might it be in the dictionary, yeah. but reject it. Yeah. Uh, Muhammad Ali, so uh, who's a Muslim, I think, um, said science, atheists, and even religious people, in parentheses, Muslims, all seem to agree that there is no such thing as free will, right? Now, no, you have a ton of people who do believe in free will, but uh, yeah, if you're, if you're following science in the sense of just physics and particles and motion and so on, that seems to be the conclusion you would draw, right? That you, that you believe in determinism, if that's all, if that's all you think we are. Uh, atheists, yes, if they're atheists in the sense of, of naturalists, then they too, uh, it seems, you would, you would think, would, would not believe in free will. And as you pointed out, because, you know, I, I, I mentioned, I think the Quran is clear. Muhammad Ali here said he also believes that the Quran is clear. And he's saying that Muslims yeah. agree that there is no such thing as free will. So I'm assuming he's got that, big uh, problems. Then. I'm assuming that he yeah. is he's a he's a Sunni. But here's here's the problem, Muhammad Ali, and and we'll, we'll I'm sure this will this will come up again. But here's the problem. Everyone on that list acts as if there's free will, right? Don't they all do it, right? Don't they all? I mean, yeah, you when, can't live that way. You yeah. can't live when as it's, Determinism is true. When, uh, when some person does something horrible to an atheist, if you walk up to an atheist and just slap the crap out of him, he's outraged. How dare you? How could you? And he's going to act like you could have done something else, like you could have chosen to do something else. When, guess what? If that's his worldview, that's what you were determined to do, right? There was nothing else that you could have done. The only way you could have done something different is if the causes that led up to that had been different and the causes that led up to that are not going to be different. So that's all you could really do. So atheists, Muslims, Christians, everyone, we all seem to act as if we have this thing called free will. And that's kind of the problem, right? If, you're, if your worldview, if your worldview tells you that there's no such thing as free will, and yet we all seem to, to act and think like we have free will, then basically 
something's something's wrong here and that that's kind of why we discuss it we're just in, we're just kind of introducing the issues uh here for for people to think about because guess what it takes a lot longer to really get to the bottom of this. there are very intelligent people on all sides of this issue who are ready to defend all sides of the issue so don't go yeah i just add that you know he says science uh says that there's no free will can i see that again can you, oh, yeah. um uh, science doesn't say anything scientists mm -hmm might and and not all scientists it's not like it's a uh, unanimous uh, the majority might feel that way but i know uh i know scientists really good scientists um personally at secular universities who affirm libertarian free will um he says atheists uh believe that there's no free will i think most atheists believe that but i know atheists uh, in fact i quoted a whole bunch of them uh, well, maybe not hold back, but I quoted several big time ones and <laughs> big time atheists and uh, respected philosophers um, in my dissertation. So you guys, you got guys like John Searle, for example. He's a you know great advocate of libertarian free will, and he's an atheist. Um, you say that religion. Uh, I think Dave. I think you said it. Uh, not all Muslims believe. I mean, That's some correct. Muslims believe you have free will mm -hmm. and libertarian free will. And I mean, I think uh, at least. I don't know what the percentage is, but I think most Christians, as Calvinists, many Calvinists don't, but some Calvinists believe we have libertarian free will. And then I think the rest of Christians probably, if you're not a Calvinist, you almost definitely believe that we've got libertarian free will. Mm -hmm. um, and so, uh, yeah, it's just not that simple um, to say that, uh, you know, all these things or people don't think you have it. But I've got arguments, several arguments uh, that demonstrate that we've got to have free will. No, you've and, got arguments that you think demonstrate that well, we have Well, they're free deductive. Will. They're, so if the premises are true, uh, then the conclusions follow deductively and the conclusions must be true if the premises are true. Oh, one, one second, one second. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. I just wanted to try and illustrate what, what, what's kind of going on here uh, with uh, what's called uh, folk psychology, right? There are, there are tests that... Uh, that people will, will take and they kind of demonstrate certain common ways of thinking, right? Like they do, uh, they do a test where they'll, they'll, they'll ask if a, if a plane is, <laughs> is, is flying and it's a bomber plane and it wants to hit a target down here, where should it drop the bomb? And so it will give you choices, A, B, C, or D, right? And tons of people who, who haven't studied physics at all, uh, will say you drop the bomb right right over top of it and the bomb's going to fall down and uh, it's going to hit the target right some even some even say d right that it the 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 plane should go a little past it and that somehow ejecting it is going to somehow push it backwards to to hit the target and so people's views are all over the place right so what what happens when you're, you, you just sort of naturally believe that once the plane is over the target, then, you know, you drop the bump? Because if you, if you, if you know anything about uh, how the world actually works, the plane should drop the bomb way back here because the, the plane is going forward at a, at a very rapid rate. And so when it drops the bomb, the bomb is actually going to be moving forward and it's going to hit the target. So the plane needs to drop the bomb way back here. And there are actually people who will calculate where given given the speed of the plane they will have to calculate where we drop the bomb in order to hit that target um but here's the point we know we know from science we know from the basic laws of physics exactly where that plane should release that bomb given the speed that it's going if it wants to hit this target that is a certain number of feet below uh lower than the plane um, so what happens when you think, you think the world is one way, you think you have to be right over it and drop it, but in reality, science shows something else. Well, so the idea is, hey, there can be times when what you think is in conflict with what science shows and which one should you drop? Well, in that situation, you should, once you find out, once you find out how the world actually works, what science actually says about where to drop the bomb, then you should say, okay, I thought this and there, but that was wrong because science shows me I'm wrong. So here's the question. What happens if you believe in free will and you believe you have the kind of free will that uh, gives us moral freedom, that's required for moral freedom and, rational, and freedom. rational freedom? What happens if you believe that you have that kind of freedom, but the scientist comes in and says, actually, no, 
every thought you've ever had, you, you, you were determined to have that thought. And guess what? The process, the same cause and effect that leads to true beliefs in certain cases leads to false beliefs in other cases. And particles do not care. Particles do not care about true or false, right? So how can you trust any beliefs when the exact same process that produces true beliefs also produces false beliefs? And again, the particles do not care. So you can't just say, here's the particles I were given and mine are all correct and everyone else's yeah. are wrong. But that's, notice, the same applies, the same applies if everything is determined by God. If God is determining everything, um, then you, you kind of end up you kind of end up in the in the same situation when someone comes in and says hey god has determined every one of your your thoughts then what do you do with your belief that you have freedom that you have mm -hmm. that you have the kind of uh moral freedom and rational freedom that would make you responsible and, and rationally responsible and so on what happens if you you, it really seems like you have this kind of freedom because we normally do. When you do something, right? If I lift my hand right now, it really seems to me that I could have done otherwise. It really seems to me that I, I didn't have to. I, I could have done something else, right? It, it seems like that. Seems me. intuitively obvious. Yeah. yeah. So what happens when either the scientist or the theologian <clears throat> steps in and says, actually, no, you are always going to do that. Either God or particles in motion were going to make you do that. What happens? What happens? And so... Yeah, that that's the situation we're, we're we're dealing with because you either you either have to you you either have to drop the belief that we're determined, or you have to drop the belief that we have genuine, uh, rational and moral freedom, or you have to drop the belief that they're in conflict. Right? You have to you have to drop that belief. In which case, you'd be a, a compatibilist. So that's the situation we're in. But but our good friend Tim here believes he has deductive sound arguments, meaning the logic is valid and the premises are true, showing, showing that we actually have libertarian freedom, in which case we are not uh, determined mm -hmm. in, in the way that determinists say we're determined. So wait, before we, before we get into <clears throat> that, what do you think of this question here? Yeah. Paul H. says, where does the Bible say that God knows the future? God knows everything that is, but we can still disappoint him or even surprise him. God changed his plans many times because of how people responded. For example, Nineveh. So mm -hmm. this is Paul H. in the super chat. So he's claiming, uh, I'm guessing Paul is, a, is an open theist, that God does not know the future. That God does not yeah. know the future. Um, so what are, your, what are your thoughts on that? Uh, you know, Kirk McGregor, I just had him as a guest on my podcast, and he spent, I uh, interviewed him for two hours, and he probably talked about this for, uh, it seemed like an hour. So I'd, I'd encourage people to go look at Kirk McGregor's work. He's a, he's a philosopher and a great theologian, and, uh, and he, he talks about these uh, anthropomorphisms uh, and uh, manners of speaking about God changing his mind. And with Molinism, it makes perfect sense because uh, God is speaking um, counterfactually, or, or these uh, authors would be describing uh, his knowledge in a counterfactual sense. But uh, God, I mean, there's prophecy all the time in Scripture, so it seems like God knows the future. And if these beings are uh, free and God's not causally determining, um, then God has to know the, the, uh, the future of free creatures. And I've got biblical and uh, philosophical arguments uh, demonstrating that we are free. Mm -hmm. um, so on top of that, a maximally great being uh, would know the future. So the vast majority of Christians throughout history believe that uh, God knows the future. And uh, you're in a, I, I would say the open theist, um, there, there are... There is a view out there called open theism. They're saying that God doesn't know the future. That's a seems to be a, a definite minority behind the doors of the church. Yeah, I, I would say. I mean, so, so guys, if you don't, if you don't, if 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 we're if you're not understanding what's going on here, so in a passage like um, you know Adam and Eve sin, and God shows up and you know, hey, where are you? Right. So the mm -hmm. the. It sounds like our friend here is is interpreting this to mean that God doesn't know where they are, right? And then when he asks Adam, "What have you done?" seems to think that God really doesn't know what he's done, um, or maybe he does know. He does believe that since since Adam has done it, that therefore 
he knows it then, but just doesn't know the future. But but notice um, when uh, when you think God is 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 surprised by our actions, and you know, and, and you you think that that means that God just doesn't know it. Uh, think about that situation right there in the garden. Uh, even open theists would believe that once it's happened, that God then knows it, right? That once the free choice has been made, that God then knows what the choice is, right? God knows the present. God knows everything in the present, right? But God is still going, what have you done? What have you done, right? So, yeah. Uh, it's a manner of speaking. Yeah, it's uh, that's that's God communicating with us, giving us opportunities to, to repent of things, um, but yeah, God comes to us as that, like, what have you done? Oh my goodness. What have you done? But to, th to say therefore that, that God didn't know the present and he's actually confused and, and doesn't know what Adam did, uh, would be, would be sort of like saying that, that God doesn't know the future. Um, if God, you know, if, if Jesus, according, according to the plan is supposed to be crucified and that's all a part of God's plan, it seems like God knows what's happening along the way. Even though, even though when we sin, he can say, what, what have you done here? Oh, my goodness. Right? So that would be the normal position. I think that would be the natural understanding of Scripture. Uh, one, one comment I did want to focus on here that's uh, off topic, but uh, important enough to go off topic, I think. Um, Bisman Gaming said, I want to believe in God, but I've been through too much stuff to believe Ooh. he is real. I don't know. So notice, he's been through too much stuff to believe God is real. Um, Bisman, I would argue with you. I would say that if you've been through a lot of stuff, then God exists. <laughs> right? If you've been through a lot of stuff, then God exists. If you've been through horrible times, then God exists. You say, what does that mean? Well, guess what? In order for you to go through a lot of stuff, <laughs> what do you need? You need a universe, right? Where are you getting your universe from? Um, not just any sort of universe, not just any sort of universe will do. You need a, a universe that, that is capable of supporting life. And that means it needs to be finely tuned. All the laws of nature need to be finely tuned, balanced on a razor's edge, the scientists say, uh, for life to even exist. Uh, but even that isn't enough. You can have a beautiful house without actually having anyone live there. Uh, you also need life right so you can have a you can have a, a a universe that's that's perfect for life but you still need the life so where are you getting the life from right um not just any kind of life you know we're not just talking about an amoeba or a cat or something like that uh in order for you to be going through things and to recognize these things that you're going through and to be concluding that god doesn't exist because uh because of these things you're going through you need human consciousness right you need a kind of consciousness that is beyond the the animal kingdom uh, you need a kind of self-awareness you need all kinds of things, right? Uh, in addition to that, if you're claiming that, um, that uh, belief in God is somehow inconsistent with all of the things that you've gone through, this means that you believe in, in laws of logic. What, are, what in the world are laws of logic, right? What in the world are laws of logic? They're not, you don't find them with a microscope or with a telescope. They're not physical, they're conceptual, right? They're concepts, that means they exist in the mind. Uh, but guess what? The laws of logic were true before any human being existed. And so there were concepts, there were concepts that are grounded in something that, that pre-exists us. And so you have some sort of conscious mind that is grounding all these things and mathematical truth. So you have all of that. And also you believe that you are capable of reasoning through these things properly, using logic, using your reason. This means that you trust your cognitive faculties but if 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 atheism is certainly naturalism if naturalism were true where did you get your your reasoning ability well as we've been pointing out one your your all your thoughts are are causally determined um so i i certainly wouldn't trust my reasoning ability if i thought that every thought that i that has ever entered my mind was was caused by something that that pre-existed me um so one i wouldn't trust it for that but two if if the standard account of how you arrived at your cognitive faculties is true, where did you get your reasoning ability from? You got your reasoning ability through the evolutionary process, and that's a process that favors basically two things, survival and reproduction, right? Favors traits, favors traits that help you survive and reproduce. So mm -hmm. the traits that helped your ancestors survive and reproduce are, uh, that's what was selected so that you now have your reasoning ability. Notice, 
the same process that gave you your reasoning abilities, the exact same process that gave the baboon its colorful buttocks and the tiger its claws, right? It's the same process, right? The, 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 the claws helped the tiger survive. The colorful buttocks of the baboon helped it attract a mate. Your reasoning ability helped you find food better and make a spear and things like that. That's where you got that. Your ability to reason through theological issues was not produced by something that was making sure you had reliable ability to uh, to form a correct view on this. It was filmed. I mean, it was formed by a process that's making sure you can find food and find a mate. Right. Again, the same process. That, 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 that's the same thing that gave a mouse its abilities. Right. The mouse sees its buddy stuck to a glue trap. It knows, OK, maybe I shouldn't step on that glue trap. Same process that gave you your reasoning ability. Why in the name of common sense would you think that something that was that was the same process that produced a mouse's reasoning ability, if you can even call it a reasoning ability, somehow gave you the ability to form correct conclusions about the almighty, about the origin of the universe? Why would you think that? And so I would say if you're going through hard times and you've gone through a lot in your life and you still trust your reasoning ability and you still believe in laws of logic and you believe in human rationality and you believe in, and you have human consciousness and you're in this universe, this finely tuned universe with your incredibly com complex, sophisticated biological activities going on. I would say if you have gone through bad times and you're forming conclusions about God, then God exists. Mm -hmm. Atheism does not make tr make sense, given what you just said right here. So can I add a little bit to that? that? You can add a thousand things to that. Awesome. Because I think this topic of libertarian free will actually uh, helps a little bit here. Um, so I, I want you to, to take a moment and think about a, a story with me. What if it's true that um, God created uh, humans to be in a true love relationship with him and all people? for eternity. You know, I, I believe that uh, true love requires libertarian free will. And I believe that God created humanity uh, with libertarian free will so that we could be in a true love relationship with God and all people. But love, if love requires freedom, then the same ability that, that allows you to love and other people to love when used in a backwards manner is evil. And that's easy to remember because love spelled backwards is evil. Well, that's not the right spelling, but you can remember it that way. All right. So love backwards is evil. Well, I believe that <laughs> you just <laughs> evil. 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 Okay. Um, so I, I think that the suffering that so much of it that we experience so much, you say that you've been through too much. Well, I'm guessing that a lot of that is pain and evil and suffering and affliction. Well, Paul says in 2 Corinthians 4.17 that these light momentary afflictions are preparing us for an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. Paul's, Paul's basically saying that pain, evil, suffering, and affliction prepares you for eternity, right? No pain, no gain. It's basically what he's the first person to ever say that, basically, is no pain, no gain. And, and I believe that it prepares us. We learn from this, right? So if you, if you awoke tomorrow in a state of affairs in which you weren't going through anything anymore, you weren't experiencing pain, evil, and suffering, would you take that for granted? Um, I bet you'd say, yeah, this is the way it's supposed to be. This is the way it ought to be. And I agree with you. That is the way it ought to be. But I, I think... Uh, you won't take that for granted. I know I won't. I've experienced a lot of suffering myself, a ton of it. I've experienced a lot of evil. I know Dave has too. And uh, what are you talking about? You're like Mr. Perfect, Mr. No. Perfect Family. No. What? What's the worst thing? He he blew out his his knee, so he can't fight MMA anymore. Yeah, That's like right. the end of his world. I wish. I wish that was it. <laughs> um, now you know I've experienced moral evil from from people. <laughs> I've experienced natural evil. You mentioned some of it. Uh, you know, it's, I've experienced the way things ought not be. That's, that's evil. And I know that, that when I wake up one day in a state of affairs in which there is no pain, evil, and suffering, which I'm not experiencing it or anybody else is experiencing it, I know I won't take it for granted. Now, Paul says that this prepares us for that state, right? That this, that the suffering prepares us for that uh, state of affairs for uh, for eternity. 
But how does it prepare us? Well, we've got a gift. We've experienced suffering. Unlike Satan and a third of, you know, unlike Adam and Eve, they were created in a perfect state of affairs. They messed it up. They took it for granted. They wrecked it. Satan and a third of all the angels took it for granted. They wrecked it. So unlike Adam, Eve, Satan, and a third of all the angels, we've had the blessing of suffering. And I hate suffering. But Paul tells it that it tells us that it does prepare us for eternity. So I'm not going to wreck it. You know, even I believe I'm going to have free will into, into heaven, into eternity. But unlike uh, Adam, Eve, Satan, and a third of all the angels, I, I'm not going to take it for granted and wreck it. And it sounds like you're learning from it too, and that you wouldn't take a perfect state of affairs for granted either. I tell you what, I can't wait for heaven. I, uh, you know, suffering's not cool, but it prepares us, it teaches us. Someone told me to give a thumbs up. All right, thanks. <laughs> Um, all right, here is a, uh, here's a follow-up to our other question from Paul H. He said, how about the example of Nineveh, though? This prophecy clearly wasn't fulfilled because of their response. So, so the, mm. the uh, claim here is that uh, in Jonah, God says he's going to destroy Nineveh. And then he sends uh, Jonah there. Jonah tries to run away. Why? Because it had been prophesied that the Assyrians are going to come and destroy Israel, right? So been prophesied. Jonah knows this. And so when God says, go preach there so that I, so that I won't destroy them, um, Jonah tries to run away, right? If Jonah runs away, then they're not going to hear, and then they won't repent, and then if. they won't be around for, what, to, to what, fulfill the prophecy. Yeah, what yeah. would happen if? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, uh, Paul, uh, I, think, I think you're reading this in the same very, very strange way that is, uh, is very confusing to me. If you think God doesn't know that they're going to repent, and God is saying, Think about this. Why would God send Jonah if God knows, if, if God doesn't, it, let, me put, let me put it this way. If God is saying, I'm going to destroy them, and that's what I'm going to do, why would he send Jonah to preach to them, giving them the opportunity to repent? Why would he, why would he do that, right? You're saying he's just going to destroy them. And so, oopsie, he couldn't fulfill his own prophecy because he didn't know they were going to repent. Um. What, the, the the normal the normal natural way of interpreting these and you you even find you even find this god tells them god tells you know he tells the israelites uh i'm i'm, I'm always going to be with you and i'm going to do these things i'm going to protect you but then he also tells them it's conditional it's if you do these things then then that's what i'm going to do if you if you if you don't do these things then no nope, that that that's going to change the, the 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 plans are going to change right so the normal, the normal way of interpreting this is God says, I'm going to destroy this. And what that means is it's a kind of conditional. If they continue on this path, then I'm going to do this. That's what I'm going to do. But God sends them a prophet so that they don't continue on that path. The idea that God, therefore, doesn't know what they're going to do. Guess what? It was, that's, that's completely consistent with God knowing what they're going to do, right? If they don't repent, is God going to destroy them? Yes. Yeah, so God says, I'm going to destroy them. Then God sends them a prophet to preach to them. Your, your conclusion is, therefore, God didn't know what they were going to do. Uh, I, would, I would just say that is a very, very strange method of, uh, of interpreting the scripture to conclude that. Uh, because again, why, why, is God sending, why is God sending prophets? Right? Um, it, what, what God should have said is, I don't know what I'm going to do because I don't know the future. Right? That's what he should have said. He should have said, hey, I'm going to destroy them. Uh, but we understand what God means when he says, I'm going to destroy them given their current path. That's why I'm sending you to do something about it. All right. What do we got here? Um, let me uh, add this in a, an article I wrote on my website, freethinkingministries.com. And, and I encourage you to check it out. It's called Molinism is Biblical. And I look at uh, some biblical examples uh, that demonstrate that humans have libertarian freedom and that God possesses. Uh, not just uh, the knowledge of the future, but counterfactual knowledge. And uh, let's see here. So um, we talked about, uh, David gave one example in 1 Samuel 23, 6-14. Um, let's see, Jeremiah 38, 17, and 18 also provides support of God's counterfactual knowledge. Uh, that passage makes it clear that God knows what would happen no matter what course of action Zedekiah would choose to take. Um, so I, I encourage you to take a look at Jeremiah 30. So the one that uh, Dave was talking about was 1 Samuel 23, 6 through 14. Uh, take a look at Jeremiah 38, 17 through 18. Um, uh, then De uh, Deuteronomy 18, verse 22. And then 
Isaiah 38, uh, 1 through 5, Amos 7, 1 through 6, and even Jonah 3, 1 through 10. So check this out. Um, you know, many scriptures uh, like those provide illumination regarding the kind of knowledge that God has. Uh, so the test of a true prophet, for example, is the fulfillment of his prediction. I mentioned Deuteronomy 18, verse 22. Many predictions given by biblical prophets, however, are never fulfilled because the people who these prophecies uh, were delivered to responded by changing their lives. And that's the Isaiah passage, the Amos passage, and the Jonah passage. They changed their lives. Thus, the people who chose to change their lives avoided the consequences of what would have happened if they had not changed direction. So that's not God's knowledge of what would happen if. And it's kind of like a, uh, the Christmas Carol, um, the ghost of, Chris, of Christmas future, right? When he comes to visit Scrooge. And, and the ghost of Christmas future knows the future, right? And he tells Scrooge what's going to happen. And then what does Scrooge do? He's like, wait, is this, I can't remember the exact quote, but basically saying, is this what will happen? Or is this what would happen if I don't change my life? You know, and then Scrooge goes on to change his life. And the future, or well, what was prophesied for him, never happened. So that's really a counterfactual knowledge. And, uh, and I, I believe that God's got to have this knowledge. I mean, the Bible's clear that God has this knowledge, counterfactual knowledge. And so uh, really the question is, how long has God had that knowledge or has he possessed it eternally? And that uh, gets us into Molinism. But. Um, response about open theism here. Christian from Muslim says, it is easy to straw man open theism. Uh, if we truly have a choice, a degree of open theism is necessary, but God certainly can influence the outcome he wants. Uh, we're not rejecting open theism because we want to uh, we want to straw man it. We mm -hmm. reject open theism because we we don't believe it, right? We we don't believe it. Now, just just to, just to be fair, I'll give you I'll give you the best I'll give you the best defense I can of open theism, right? It would no, go, I don't want to tell them why that's yeah, false. Yeah, it, it would. Yeah, yeah. yeah well, uh, yeah, yeah. I, would, I would reject that as well. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, here here's the best that I could say, right? Does omnipotence mean that God can do absolutely anything? And the answer is no. Uh, omnipotence means that God can do anything that's logically possible. And some, you, could, you could add other things like consistent with his nature and things like that. Um, but at the very least, we would, we would say that uh, it doesn't mean that God can do logical impossibilities, right? God, it doesn't, omnipotence doesn't mean that God can do what is logically impossible, right? That God doesn't mean that God can make a square circle or a married bachelor or something like that. Those things are contradictory. They're not things that can be brought into existence, right? So omnipotence doesn't mean that God can do absolutely anything. It doesn't mean that he can do things that are logically impossible. So does omniscience mean that God knows absolutely everything? No, it means, and I'm not defending this. I'm saying that this is, this is the, I think, the best you could say. No, omniscience would mean that God knows everything that can be known, but that would only include the past and it would include the present and it would include things that he knows he's going to do in the future, but things that free creatures are going to do in the future are not things that can be known. So God knows everything that can be known, but the free decisions of, of creatures in the future are, are not able to be known right now. And so there's no conflict between God's omniscience and um, uh, his, his being ignorant of certain things that will happen in the future because they're things that cannot be known. So I'm hoping that you don't think I'm straw manning that. I think that is the best case that anyone can make for open theism. I just don't believe that anything I just said is uh, is true. Yeah. Right? <laughs> so you're being charitable, and then yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm just saying because you know if the complaint is oh you guys are just giving a caricature of mm -hmm. or a straw man or something, um, uh, I think that's the best you can. I think what I just said is the best defense you can make of open yeah. theism. Uh, I just don't believe that what I just said is true. But what do you so think? yeah, in the in the three sentences here, it's easy to a straw man open theism. That's true. It's that's easy. True. To, it's yeah, easy yeah. to straw man anything. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I think. We're being charitable. Uh, next sentence, if we truly have a choice, a degree of open theism is necessary. I disagree. I that's think right. that's I disagree. false. Mm -hmm. um, 
because knowledge of what one would freely do does not, uh, well, knowledge doesn't stand in causal relation, right? Knowing what somebody will freely do doesn't mean it wasn't freely chosen. So uh, yeah, knowledge, it's easy to remember, knowledge does not stand in causal relation. A good way to think about this a thought experiment here is imagine a, a weather barometer. And let's just pretend and suppose uh, that somebody invented an infallible weather barometer. You know, you type in uh, the, the location on the planet and the date and you know this infallible weather barometer always gets it exactly right so you type in uh, what's it going to do in spain what's the weather going to be like in spain 10 years from today and it spits it out it says 10 years from today it's going to rain in spain easy to remember because it rhymes but it's going to rain in spain 10 years from today so we sit around and wait let's just see if this uh infallible weather barometer is really infallible well what do you know 10 years from today comes and it rains in spain well did the weather barometer cause the rain in Spain? No, it simply knew that it was going to rain in Spain. So you see, knowledge does not stand in causal relation. There's no causal strings attached here. Just knowing what somebody will freely do, or knowing what somebody would freely do, uh, does not mean that it wasn't freely done. Uh, the word freely is still there. Now, your last sentence, but God can certainly or God certainly can influence the outcome he wants. Sure, I affirm influence. I just reject causal determinism. And those are two different things. Those are two philosophically different things. God does influence, but mere influence is highly different uh, than causal determinism. And those two things ought not be conflated. Yeah, um, I, 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 I used to think of it like this. Um, imagine that we could actually travel through time and... Um, you know, you go back to a time when someone's about to do something and you know what they're going to do. And let's suppose that you can only time travel as an observer, right? You can go back and all you can do is observe and you don't actually causally influence anything. You have no impact on what's going on just because, you know, from the future, what someone is going to do in a decision doesn't mean they're not free to do it, right? You, you are, you already know it because you're in the future. You're not influencing that in any way, right? You're, uh, you you know about it from the future, but uh, so even, you're saying, if, even if, if you were watching it, you're saying if Abraham Lincoln freely gave the Gettysburg Address and that was free and yeah. then you time traveled back <clears throat> to right before he's about to right. give the, the, the yeah. Gettysburg Address. But I influence absolutely nothing. Right. I influence absolutely nothing. I'm just it allows you to go back and, and observe yeah. in an invisible fashion. Yeah. He doesn't um, lose his freedom all of a sudden. Magic. Yeah, I wouldn't. Right. Yeah, I wouldn't. I, I would have no idea how my observing this or being aware of it or having the knowledge of what he's going to do would somehow take away his his freedom. That's good. And likewise, likewise, I wouldn't understand how uh, God, knowing all of our free decisions, because you know, however you want to put it, whether uh, God is is timeless, uh, whatever, however you want to put it, that, that God sees everything as present before Him. Um, yeah, I don't see how God's knowledge, uh, is, has any causal role in, in what we're doing there with, with, with that said, with that said, guys, just to be clear, I'm not settled in, in, in any of my position. I'm even, I'm even not yeah. settled on the determinism versus the libertarianism. I'm right. not, I, I just being a good philosopher. I see the yeah. arguments yeah. in favor of both of them. And there are people I really respect on both sides of the issues Amen. and whenever Amen. there whenever there's a position i look at both sides and i say wow these are guys i really respect over here and on the opposite side these are guys i really respect over here um and i see why these guys have this position and i see why these guys have this position and i do see some difficulties with that position and i do see some difficulties with that position i normally think to myself Wow, I probably am not going to get to the bottom of that unless I really, really spend a lot of time studying this issue and going through at least the major works on the issue before coming down on a, coming down on one side or the other. But this is one of the issues where I've just never taken a lot of time because I'm kind of always busy dealing with, you know, Islam or, or atheists or something like that. And this like is that. what I did my doctoral dissertation on. Yeah, so, so this so, is my laser focus. Yeah, yeah, so 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 basically, when you hear me uh, defending a certain position or defending a certain perspective, don't think, oh, this is David's position. I mm -hmm. I, I don't I don't have it. I'm, I'm basically trying to give the argument as, as uh, state the argument as, as clearly as I can. Um, and I'll just say my main focus is interacting with determinists, uh, not open theists. I have colleagues who laser focus on open theism. 
Um, you know, I think, uh, well, you, you can find some of these articles uh, on my website. Um, and I do, I do discuss open theism a little bit in my uh, dissertation, but my main focus is the determinists, those who affirm uh, exhaustive divine determinism or exhaustive uh, forces of nature determinism. Uh, that's what I think is, uh, you know, th those views are, are false. I think we have good reasons to affirm that. But then I consider myself to be reformed as well. So along with uh, many of these people that uh, hold to exhaustive divine determinism, well, they're Calvinists and they consider themselves reformed. Uh, I don't call myself a Calvinist, but I like to show how Calvinists can still affirm libertarian free will and uh, God's middle knowledge, actually, and what I call mere Molinism. So you can be a Calvinist and a Molinist simultaneously. Um, and so, I, you know, I'm at a, I did my dissertation, my doctoral work at a Reformed, well, it was a secular university with a Reformed uh, theology department. And so, uh, yeah, I'd love to have this conversation, and I'm really interested in helping, uh, just help, helping people see that there is good reason to affirm libertarian freedom, at least some of the time, at least, you know, and I, I'm not saying that if you have libertarian freedom, you got this, this free will and a, you know, what I call a genuine sense, we'll just call it libertarian free will. That doesn't mean that you can go out and freely do whatever you want. It doesn't mean you can freely choose to jump to the top of a skyscraper. Mm -hmm. That's not within my nature. It's, it's not, not saying unlimited freedom right. to it, do anything. It's, right? So the word compatible, that's not compatible with my nature, even if I'm free to take the stairs or take the elevator to the top of the skyscraper. So those two things are compatible with my nature. And uh, I believe I can choose uh, between a range of options, each compatible with my nature. So I like to call myself a libertarian compatibilist. You know, normally compatibilism and libertarianism are, are at odds with each other, but the compatibilist is assuming that uh, there's only one thing you can do at each moment that's compatible with your nature. And I say, well, why? Why think a thing like that? Why couldn't it? God create us in his image and his likeness with the ability to do several things uh, compatible with our image of God nature? God must have uh, libertarian freedom. In fact, uh, the very definition of omnipotence uh, means that God has options. Uh, he's got to have options available for him to do that he never did, right? But that he could have done. And to say otherwise is to deny his omnipotence. So, uh, I mean, at the very least, God could have uh, refrained from creating the universe. And so God's got a range of options, each compatible with his nature. He can create the universe or not create the universe. And so why can't God create humans in his image who have the same, the same kind of ability? To say, you know, in his likeness, who can choose between a range of options, each compatible with our image of God nature as well. So um, if God is omnipotent it seems that he could you know and, and like dave said he could do all things logically possible well it's logically coherent that libertarian free will or libertarian free will is a logically coherent concept because god can create the universe or not create the universe so can god create a being can god create creatures who have the ability to choose between a range of options each compatible with their image of god nature um even if he never does and then the next question, you know, that I think most Calvinists will say yes to is, is God omniscient? You know, if God's omniscient, then in that, even if he never did create free creatures, he would know how God, or God would know how the, the creatures within his, the, he has the power to create. He, he would know how they would freely choose if he creates them. And then you've got some flavor of Molinism because that's middle knowledge there. So... There you go. <laughs> um, let's take a couple of uh, questions real quick. First one, completely off topic, but uh, I'm get, I get a lot of these, uh, so I'll answer real quick. Uh, can I ask uh, wh what you will do the next Boom Boom Room? Uh, so what's what's next in the Boom Boom Room, or is that a secret? No, it's not a secret. Um, the next Muhammad's Boom Boom Room is Muhammad meets Jeffrey Epstein. Uh, the only reason I haven't made it yet was we, I mean, we already recorded it. We, we, we've recorded, I think we've recorded, I don't know, four or five more episodes that we haven't uh, posted yet. But, uh, the Muhammad meets Jeffrey Epstein, uh, 
I just, you know, I ordered a gray wig, but it kind of didn't look like Epstein's hair. So I already wasn't, uh, that's why I shaved so I could be uh, Epstein because he was clean shaven. <laughs> um, but the gray wig kind of didn't look like his hair. So I wasn't happy with that. Apart from that, when we recorded it, it is hard to find audio recordings of him. And so we were sort of rushing around to find audio recordings. We couldn't find anything that was really clear. So I didn't have any clear voice or accent in mind uh he vocab found a tiny little clip and he sounded sort of like sort of brooklyn jewish accent and so i kind of rolled with that but i wasn't consistent and so yeah i was just i wasn't i wasn't happy with uh with um with the look or with my accent being consistent so i kind of haven't made it but i was talking to vocab yesterday and he said just you know just make it what the the, the storyline is the storyline is hilarious so vocab saying that the storyline is actually enough to carry it uh in spite of the the dumb looking wig and stuff so he may be right so yeah i'll, I'll get around but uh, apart from that i've been down here for a few days and we've been working on uh youtube stuff and mastering youtube stuff and uh so but yeah i'm 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 heading home tomorrow and so i'll get back to that uh now more to the point this is a decent one john warner says doesn't free will's rejection of determinism undermine causation altogether since causation seems to consist in a cause determining an effect what is your concept of causation so if if there's if you have uh, so, matter of fact, let's just go ahead and read it again. Does it free will's rejection of determinism? So, free will in the libertarian sense. Keep in mind there are compatibilists who believe that you do have free will in an important sense and, and that we are determined, right? Um, but so, libertarian free wills, does, doesn't libertarian free will's rejection of determinism undermine causation altogether? In other words, if there are situations where some things are not caused by simply by the you know the things that happened right before it um doesn't that undermine causation altogether since causation seems to consist in a cause determining an effect what is your concept of causation yeah. you have any response to that yeah i mean i i think causation is usually true uh i mean i i love the kalam cosmological argument that's a great uh argument showing that some things are caused. God caused the universe to come into existence. Um, so it doesn't, uh, I mean, so I affirm limited libertarian freedom, and that just means that uh, humans have something about us in our image of God nature that can also uh, choose between a range of options, each compatible with our nature. Now our nature is not up to us really, right? It's the image of God nature that's up to God, right? And he gives it to us. I agree with the compatibilist determinist there, right? Our natures determine certain things about us. Um, and I would say our nature, uh, that caused by God ultimately, determines the set of things from which I can freely choose. So, yeah, it doesn't, I don't know, do you think I'm answering his question? Maybe I don't understand his question. Um, yeah, I mean, I think it's basically along the lines of, you know, if you're saying, if you're saying, uh, if you're saying if you're saying some of our decisions or choices or whatever are not caused by right. the things that happened right before, then you're just you're just throwing causation right. out, and 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 it, it, it's basically because I've heard I've heard uh, atheists put it this way. You know, if you believe in divine intervention, then you just the laws of nature go out the window, and yeah. and anything yeah, yeah, yeah. And like anything could happen, sort of sort of deal. Yeah, I think many things are uh, caused and determined. My appendix. I had an appendix attack. You know, I didn't have a, I didn't have free will over that. Uh, lost my hair. That, I, you know, that wasn't up to me. Um, but I think I can evaluate certain concepts, right? I, I'm the one that does it. I can think of and about certain concepts. I can evaluate uh, certain ideas as good or bad. Uh, I can infer the best explanation. Uh, now, if I can't infer the best explanation, but something else is doing that for me, then I don't stand in a position to know if it really is the best. Uh, or if, I, if there was a better option, I should have chosen, right? Uh, you know, I gave that mad scientist thought experiment. Um, if the mad scientist is causally determining exactly what I think of and about and exactly how I think of and about it, uh, then I can't rationally affirm anything. I can't rationally affirm that I'm 
uh, believing the best, that I'm inferring the best explanation. I can assume it, but then that mad scientist is causing and determining my assumption. Even that assumption's not up to me. I don't even have an ability to evaluate or judge anything. So again, there's that vertigo that sets in if you start to affirm determinism. It just doesn't make any rational sense. Yeah, you know, let, uh, let me add something. So uh, first, let me go to the idea of, of, let's say, divine intervention, because I think it's sort of a bigger example of the, of the same thing. So um, people are, there are people who would claim that if you have laws of nature, but God can intervene into the laws of nature as a miracle, right? So if there's a miracle, then that would be God intervening in the laws of nature. And then that would just mean, you know, what are the laws of nature if God, even God doesn't have to follow them, right? So uh, they would view this as a problem, but um, you can view the, the laws of nature as, as also like contingent in a sense, meaning that this is how things operate if God doesn't intervene in some way, right? So right. Uh, so you can think of this in a, in a purely physical sense. Like I can say, hey, I, I'm going to drop this cell phone. And if I drop this cell phone and I don't catch it, then I know exactly what's going to happen. It's going to fall down and, and hit this table. But there's something else that could happen. I could decide to, uh, you know, to to catch it. So, I, you know, more than one thing could happen depending on what I do. So laws of nature is just this is how this thing is going to happen. This is how this person is going to die if someone does not intervene. Uh, you can believe the same thing about causation if you, if you also believe in, in libertarian free will. You can say, this, this is how these particles are going to move, and this is how these things are all going to happen, straightforward cause and effect, unless, unless someone uses libertarian freedom to alter things in one way or the other. So that, would, that, that, that doesn't destroy causation. There's still causation all over the place, right? Um, and I mean, you, you, even with the libertarian free will, you have you have the self who's causing things and so on. It's just not prior things that are prior to the self. Thus, I mean, going out and causing them. Uh, that, was that was that clear at all? Yeah, yeah. I like okay. it. I like this next question here from Abdu. Um, Abdu says, um, this out. I could scroll down, but uh, uh, Abdu says we don't have free will unless Jesus frees us. Uh, of slavery to sin. Slaves don't have free will. What are your thoughts on that? I have a whole bunch to say about that. Uh, number one, uh, uh, let's just assume that's true. All right. If I granted that for the sake of argument, uh, then fine. Then some people have free will. Uh, and I already talked about a biblical example. I said at least Christians have libertarian free will because every time the Christian is tempted to sin, God promises to provide a way of escape so that you don't have to sin. So what follows from that, since you still sin occasionally, uh, when the Christian sins, you could have done otherwise. We're not just talking about sourcehood libertarian freedom here. We're talking about the principle of alternative possibilities. You had a range of alternative options from which to choose and you failed to do the right one. So you're responsible. Like I said, don't say that Satan made me do it. And definitely don't say that God made me do it. He gave you a way of escape. And you didn't take it. So at least Christians have libertarian freedom. And so that's all I need to uh, argue for that at least some things are free. And then I'm going to say, well, is God sovereign over those free choices? And when did God know how you were going to freely choose? Um, I contend that God knew how you would freely choose as a Christian logically prior to his creative decree. And that doesn't and remember, I said knowledge doesn't stand in causal relation. So just because God knows how you would freely choose and that you would fail to take um, the way of escape doesn't mean that you didn't freely choose to sin. So that's number one. I mean, uh, so this for the sake of argument, you're still uh, seeming to affirm libertarian free will. Uh, but why think that slaves don't have any freedom? Um, or, you know, here we're specifically talking about slaves to sin. Does that mean that the unregenerate sinner doesn't have a range of options from which to choose? Does that mean that the sinner can't choose between a range of sins or things that aren't pleasing to God? Does that mean that the, the sinner can't choose to rob the bank or rob the liquor store or simply sit at home and think about robbing the bank or the liquor store? There's still a range of options from which to choose. So I think you're confusing uh, freedom and determinism and applying this to salvation issues. But I'm trying to take a step back and Let's just talk about libertarian freedom and exhaustive divine determinism. And you can have a limited libertarian freedom. 
I believe that Calvin and Luther and Melanchthon would all affirm a limited libertarian freedom. And, uh, and I think we can demonstrate and actually, you know, and I, I quoted Greg Kokel, for example, who is a five point Calvinist who would agree with you that you're, that unless God regenerates you, then you're not free to choose. Jesus isn't among the range of options from which to choose, but you still have other options. Um, as a as a slave to sin, you still have a, a range of sinful options from which to choose. Now, uh, I think that we can apply these issues to salvation, and that's where I disagree with the Calvinist. But I I also uh, am quite happy to to you know when I meet guys like Greg Kokel and say, hey, we we disagree on uh, what we should uh, allow free will to impact here. I mean, I, I say we can talk about that in regards to salvation. He says, no, but we agree that we, that there, that humans do possess a limited libertarian freedom, uh, a range of options, uh, alternative options that are each compatible with our nature. So thank you for that question. Um, but, uh, I, I do think, um, it actually supports my position. Uh, yeah, and, and my, my thoughts are just it, it kind of depends on what on what sort of freedom you're 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 talking about here, um, because that that's kind of there are all kinds of freedoms uh, at stake here, right? You can give multiple m multiple versions of, of of freedom, like freedom to you know it can be freedom to make a choice about anything, and then it's you know freedom not to sin or something like that, right? You're kind of talking about uh, talking about a variety of things here. Um, I wanted to jump in here with uh, Diva Girl Love is a Muslim uh, Muslim woman, mm -hmm. and uh, apparently she's been uh, having discussion over there. Uh, I just want to read a passage here, Diva Girl Love. She said, is the image of God black or white, male or female? Is the image of God black or white, male or female? Diva Girl Love, you're the image of God. Mm -hmm. I'm the image of God. Tim is the image of God. Human beings are created in the image of God. We're the image of God, right? Um, as far as male and female, let me just read for you. It's the opening <laughs> chapter of Genesis. You could have read it. You could, have, you could have stopped and said, let me read the opening chapter of Genesis. Um, Genesis 1.27. Matter of fact, let me go back to verse 26 because mm -hmm. it's awesome, right? Yeah. Uh, then God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. Hey, who's the us there? Who's the us there, uh, diva, diva girl love? Who's the us? You can't say angels. Angels aren't the ones creating, mm -hmm. right? But God says, let us create man in our image after our likeness. And let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. Now, what does God mean by man? Does he mean, you know, men, men, people with testosterone? No. Next verse. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. So man is used in the generic sense of uh, human beings. And then he specifically says that, uh, he created male and female in his image. So and guess what? Man. We're all men and women created in the image of God. And you know what's interesting is notice that us right there. God said, let us make man in our image. Something very interesting happens with the, the creation account of Adam and Eve. Um, you have Adam and Adam just means man, right? So God creates man, but he Adam is also a name. Right. So man, that's that's human beings. Mm -hmm. But Adam is also a name, meaning man. Right. And then there's there's Eve. But Eve is also called man. Right. So man in our image, male and female. So Eve is also called man. So notice Adam and Eve are both man in the sense of human being. But Adam is man in that. That's that's actually his name. Uh, but notice notice what happens there. Um, Adam and Eve are both man in the one sense, and yet Eve is from man as well, and Adam is named man, right? Now, you may be wondering what, where I'm going with all this. Well, that us that we have right there before that, let us make man in our image. Um, go, to, go, to, go to John 1 and read that in the light of the creation and how Eve can be both man and from man simultaneously, right? Because man can also man can also be uh, man is a name and man is a sort of a sort of uh, uh, category, right? Um, refers to the nature, refers to what you are. Um, now think about that and then read the opening verses of 
the book of John. So mm. in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God because I heard you, I heard the, the complaints about theology earlier on. But in the beginning was the word, the word is with God and the word was God. How can the word be with God and yet be God? Well, that's confusing. Well, think, how can, how can Eve be Adam and yet be with Adam? Um, it's different. It's different because we're talking about human beings and you can separate human beings and so on. But, but think about how those two things hold together right there. God is saying, let us make man in our image. And then if you're wondering how God can be one and yet be an, an us, how the word can be with God and the word can mm. be God. And then you have a sort of example. And it's, it's, it's not uh, the, the, the analogies and the parallels. They all break down. There's nothing that's actually like God. According to the Bible, there's nothing that's really like God. And according to the Quran, there's nothing that's mm. really like God. Uh, but, but we can get examples of how something can be one in one way and more than one in another way. We, we have examples of that. And right after God gives us the, the, the us, let us create man in our image. We have the, well, Adam is Adam is man, Adam is Adam, Eve is Adam, but Eve is with Adam, mm. right? Because Adam just means man. And so, uh, I'm hoping I'm hoping you pay attention. You come back for all these live streams, Diva Girl Love, and you raise a bunch of objections, and you're generally wrong in your objections. But we hope you're actually paying attention. Yeah. And I would just want to add, you know, you ask uh, not just as God male or female, male or female, but if God's black or white, and, and neither. God created all skin color. God created all skin and thus does not possess skin. Um, God is an immaterial thing. The Kalam cosmological argument, which uh, Muslims would affirm too, right? It's uh, the Kalam yeah. uh, argument, uh, gets us to a, a cause of the universe that doesn't have skin. It's not made of matter. Um, and, and so what is it about humanity that uh, allows us to be equal and in the image of God? In the same place where we get our... Uh, our unalienable and objective rights from as humans. Um, it, it's because we are created in the image of God. And this actually uh, is related to the topic of free will. Let me share a quick argument. It's, uh, it's what I call the free thinking argument. So it's a, a few steps, a few premises and some conclusions. But the first premise, the first step of the argument goes like this. If naturalism is true, then the immaterial human soul does not exist. So that's just saying if naturalism is true, nature is all that exists. Just, you know, uh, matter in motion, physics and chemistry, that's all you are, right? So if naturalism is true, the immaterial human soul does not exist. Two, if the soul does not exist, then libertarian freedom does not exist because it does stand to reason. Sam Harris and the atheists and naturalists are right. If if all we are is, you know, is a, is a physical... A body, then it stands to reason that physics and chemistry is causally determining everything about me. So I want to have libertarian freedom. So again, let me start over. One, if naturalism is true, uh, the immaterial human soul does not exist. Two, if the soul does not exist, libertarian freedom does not exist. Three, if libertarian freedom does not exist, then it's impossible to either rationally infer or rationally affirm claims of knowledge. Four, it is possible to rationally infer and rationally affirm claims of knowledge. Five, therefore, libertarian freedom exists. Six, therefore, the soul exists. That's what makes us equal in the image of God, right? Uh, therefore, naturalism is false. And finally, I, I contend that the best explanation for the existence of libertarian freedom and the existence of the soul is God. But as Dave has already demonstrated here, I think it's the biblical view of God. I think that's the best explanation of this. And so, uh, yeah, I hope you consider consider the biblical view of God. All right. Uh, well, we've been going almost two hours now. Wow. That I flew think, by. I think we barely scratched the surface of the issue. Yeah, I think you're right. I think we would have to kind of narrow down the topics in the future. Yeah. Like, like just whole program, what is Molinism? Right, right, right. right. And actually just go through that mm -hmm. and because... Uh, uh, yeah, kind of barely scratched the yeah, surface yeah, on, that's on all right. the issues. Yeah. You know what I mean? We got people's feet wet. Yeah, yeah, I know. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. what I mean. Introduction, then mm -hmm. going to more depth yeah. at, a, at, a, at a different time. Well, I just uh, encourage people to go to my website. I write about this a whole bunch. Uh, you can find blogs and videos. Dave here is trying to teach me how to be a YouTube rock star like him. I've got you know a, a long way to go, 
but I plan on making a lot of videos here uh, starting this year. But in the meantime, you can go to my website at freethinkingministries.com. I've got a whole bunch of stuff on this issue, and I encourage you to click around and um, want to, you know. Yeah, I uh, just so everyone knows, I did uh, I did include a link to Tim's YouTube channel, so he does have yeah. videos there, but he's not a rock star yet. Nah, but nah. he's gonna take he's gonna take all the information that is in uh, his articles and articles over the years and he's going to put those in in videos so you can go ahead and, and subscribe now and then you'll be subscribed when he goes through that that's assuming you're interested in name all the issues that you're kind of interested in and you're going to be covering on your channel so that they know if they're going to be interested in these and if you're not in if you're not interested in these kinds of issues then don't come over then yeah. don't come over there don't look at him speak nothing but ill of him yeah <laughs> well you know i love apologetics uh so you know those the, that cumulative case of arguments uh, whether it be the Kalam or the moral argument, uh, the fine-tuning argument, Leibnizian cosmological argument, uh, the arguments for the histor histor historical resurrection of Jesus. I love all of those. And then obviously, uh, you know, the free thinking argument. I love free will issues and, and Molinism, how to make sense of our libertarian free will and God's sovereignty. As a Molinist, I affirm that God predestines all things, but I argue and demonstrate how predestination does not equal causal determinism and how those two things ought not be conflated. So really, I think Molinism and Calvinism are uh, functionally equivalent uh, and that we really, it really comes down to the argument, uh, that the argument is how does God predestine? The Calvinist typically has one idea and the Molinist has another. Um, but I do think those two views, uh, you know, at least five-point Calvinism, gotta get my whole hand on the screen, five-point Calvinism, and the two points of mere Molinism are logically compatible with each other. So I like to spend a lot of time building bridges. I do have fun arguing, uh, but I do try to build bridges in the end. Uh, and I, you know, I talk a little bit about Islam on my mm. on my uh, website. I like to link to this guy when I do it. Smart, yeah, smart. He's you know nobody better than Dave. So uh, yeah, I think you'd like Free Thinking Ministries. Come check us out. Come check out our website and the YouTube channel. Yeah, you can find all that th by going to his YouTube channel. He has links to his uh, to his other stuff there. Uh, wanted to wanted to well, two quick comments real quick. Mm -hmm. um, Diva Girl Love says, "Is uh, is God if if God is the creator of life and death, can God be subjected to His own creation? Well, He can't be subjected to anything by His creation, but if He chooses to do something, God can." God can do what he wants, can he? I mean, if you're if you're God, Allah wanted to do that. If God wanted to do something, and keep in mind, we have we have all sorts of passages in the Muslim source about God having to travel around to 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 get closer to people, to hear their prayers, and he has to descend to the you know to the to the lowest heaven to hear prayers and things like that. Um, uh, I mean, what do you, what do you think about that, right? If if the, can God willingly enter creation, take on a human nature? and die, you know, according to his, since he would have a dual nature. Mm. If you say no, I would just encourage you to, to think about the Quran, because if you say no, then you've just destroyed Islam and you've destroyed the Quran. What is the Quran? The Quran is supposedly the eternal speech of Allah. How can Allah's eternal speech be subjected to creation? How can Allah's eternal speech be subjected to burning, right? Well, if Allah's eternal speech enters our world, enters our world, our universe, in a physical form, the physical form of a book. In other words, if it comes, if it has a kind of what? Incarnation, right? If it enters our world in a physical form made of paper and glue and ink, all of a sudden what was eternal and incorruptible, had no beginning, had no end, enters our world, and now it's in human hands. And a human being can take it, destroy it, burn it, whatever, right? Because why? Because the Quran, according to Islamic theology, has two natures. It is the eternal speech of Allah, but it enters our world in a physical form made of paper and glue and ink. So once it's taken on this additional nature, then it has a dual nature. And because it has a dual nature, it is subject to things going on in creation. Who did that? According to you, Allah did that, right? Allah did not have to give his speech in this world in that form, but he did. So Allah subjected, uh, subjected his eternal speech to human beings. Now human beings can do what they want. You can read the Quran, you can take it, you can throw it in the garbage, whatever you're doing with it, right? You have the ability to do that. Why? Because it's in our world, it has on a physical nature. Now, if you can believe that about the eternal speech of Allah, how can you say 
that God cannot enter, that, that the Jesus, the Logos, right? That the word, notice, the reason this is so sad and funny is, I mean, <clears throat> simultaneously sad and funny. Think about it, ladies and gentlemen. Muslims believe that Allah's eternal speech took on a physical form in our world, and that physical form can be destroyed. But they will tell us that the Logos, the eternal word of God, cannot enter our world as a physical human being. What's really ironic about this is, according to Muhammad, the Quran will eventually take on the form of a pale man to testify at the judgment. And so his word will take on the form of a human man. And Muslims are revolted by this idea. But when we tell them that the eternal word uh, became flesh and dwelt among us, they say, no, this is impossible. This is so silly. This is so ridiculous. Christianity is all paganism. And they don't really, like, just don't realize they're undermining their entire theology when they do that. Diva, girl, love, please, mm -hmm. by all means, please, for once. Do some studying of your own theology so that you don't uh, you don't keep uh, making these same mistakes. Uh, and one one last one by Darla Dean. We'll give a quick answer to this because we're over time now. Darla Dean said, I don't apparently know what libertarian means. Lol, I'm floating and listening, though. Just to be clear, I don't I don't even remember if we clarify this. A libertarian here in the philosophical and theological sense is not a libertarian in the political sense. Yeah, that's right. It's a different thing, although they both have an emphasis on freedom. Uh, they're different, totally different kinds of freedom there, right? You could be a libertarian in one sense and not a libertarian in another sense. I'll just go ahead and give a, a quick and you, quick definition. You can expand up on it. A libertarian is someone who believes that we have a kind of freedom that is not compatible with us being determined either by God or by the physical world. He doesn't, it doesn't mean that we believe that everything we do is free in this way. Mm -hmm. It means that something yeah. we do is free in this way. So if you believe that anything you think or anything you do, any choice you make, that you have the kind of freedom to do that that is incompatible with that choice or action or whatever being determined, being causally necessitated either by God or by the physical world, then you are a libertarian in in that sense. So what job. do you think about that? I like that. Yeah. Like that? Yeah, yeah. Good job. I try. He's a good philosopher. He knows his stuff. Well, I've been out of this stuff. I've been out of this stuff for like yeah, 10 years. Yeah, so yeah. you know, I saw uh, just looking at some of the other questions. I know we have to wrap up. Um so we can't get to all of these, but I would just we'll again, do it again. We'll do yeah, it again. Well I'll I'll be back. I'd love to be back if Dave will have me. And uh, in the meantime, please go to my website. Seeing things like uh, how do you interact with the grounding objection, uh, please go there. And, uh, um, John, Le John Lamonto, Jonathan Thompson, others have written on this. I've, got, I've written on it. Um, I've got one called Dangerous Grounds, the Grounding Objection versus Divine Determinism, which shows if you're, if you're a divine determinist, you can't affirm uh, divine determinism or, uh, I'm sorry, the grounding objection. Uh, but yeah, uh, just check it out and uh, you can contact me. Um, you can write me uh, emails. Uh, if you go to the website, you can hit contact, and and uh, and I'll try to get back to your questions. So here, here you go. Here you go. Is Tim familiar with the late great Bob Passantino's free will argument? And if so, what is your opinion about Bob it? Have you ever read that one? Passantino's. I'm not familiar I with need, that. And I need to see that. Yeah. So no. So uh, would you like to be familiar with it? Yeah. Send me an email. All right. So Loris K. Uh, Tim is interested in that. And by the way, I don't think anyone is familiar with everything on this topic. Mm -hmm. There's too much. There are certain there are certain narrow topics in philosophy where you can actually read everything on the topic. So I mm -hmm. so in, in my field, I dealt with the Bayesian argument from evil. And since that was new, it actually allowed me to read everything wow. that had been written on the Bayesian argument from evil. But something on something like free will, there is so much out there that I've got uh, a I've got a 350 page dissertation on the topic and I could not interact with everything. There's so much, but I tried to interact with what I thought was the most important to make my points. Um, here's one more. And this is actually, uh, actually a good way to close out here. Arlen three said, I'm an hour behind in the video. Don't box God in. God is sovereign. He can do both free will and predestination. He can remember my sins no more. What are your thoughts on that? Any final thoughts? Uh, uh, let me focus on what he says here. Don't box God in. God is sovereign. He can do both free will and predestination. Amen to that, right? I, I believe 
that uh, God has the power to create free creatures, mm -hmm. and he knows what free creatures would do if he creates them. So he knows this before he creates them. And so God can predestine all we freely do. And I'll tell you what, a good way to understand this on a kind of a popular level is to watch the last two Avengers movies, right? So uh, if you see Doctor Strange, he doesn't have, he's not omniscient, but he has vast knowledge and, and he looks at all these different possible futures. I'm not saying this is what God does, but it's a way to start to understand a little bit. And Doctor Strange looks at all the different possibilities. Can they defeat the evil of Thanos? And, uh, and Doctor Strange realizes there's one world or one possible future, only one out of like 16 million that we can freely defeat Thanos. And so he makes sure that that world comes about or that possible future becomes the actual future. So, so Doctor Strange sees all these uh, different uh, free will futures, if you will, have all these different futures in which the Avengers have free will, and he sees there's one in which they freely defeat Thanos, and he makes sure that that world happens, and so they freely defeat Thanos. Um, but he doesn't causally determine everything, they're still free. Anyway, I have a, another article on my website about that if you'd like to read how the Avengers sheds a little bit of light on the topic, but there you go. That was uh, the nerdiest nah, I'm a finish. Nerd. I am a nerd. It was already, so... a, nerdy, it was already a nerdy topic, and you made yeah. it even nerdier. Wow. <laughs> uh, I'll agree with Dapper Dave, though, 527. He said, I wish they called it something more friendly sounding other than Molinism. Uh, no, I agree. So, yeah, it's I named agree. At, for everyone who doesn't know, it's named after Molina, right? It's named Molina. Yeah. Molina. Luis de Molina, a Spanish monk from the 1600s. I saw one person object. He goes, Don't you know that it was a Spanish Jesuit monk? Hey, that's irrelevant where it came from. Yeah. Um, yeah. The question is why. Well, that's right. He, he's yeah. he's right. Rest, he's wrestling with the same kind of issues that that Christians in general will be wrestling with, and so if he comes up yeah. with a solution, then then he comes up with a a solution. But yeah, the guy should name it something cooler than just well, let's name it after this guy. <laughs> right. You know what yeah. I mean? Should be called Stratonism. Super cool. <laughs> super cool theological positionism or something. Yeah, like that, there, you right? go. there you go. All right, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining us. Um, we'll we'll be back, and we'll uh, we'll focus more on some particulars or some particular arguments uh, in the future for those of you who are interested in philosophy and theology and how it relates to freedom and so on. So yeah, and send us you send either me or Dave some questions that you'd like us to to wrestle with. And so next time I have the opportunity to be on here, we'll make sure we we uh, interact with you. Mm -hmm. Oh, wait, Hank, you have something from, uh, was this a follow-up here? Oh, uh, Arlen3 says, thank you for the acknowledgement. The all-knowing God can forget my sins. That is great power. Mm -hmm. That is that is interesting, right? Yeah. yeah. Uh, that God says you yeah. will rem remember the sins no more. Right. Yeah. Amen. Amen all right. to that. All right. I'll catch you all, catch you all next time. I'll be heading back tomorrow. I'll be getting back yeah. to regular classic D. Wood videos. And Dave, thank you for this opportunity. I don't take it for granted that you would uh, let me... Hang out with you for a couple hours. I agree, and I knew when I had you on that this was going to be the greatest thing in your life. <laughs> well, uh, after my wife, at least. So you know, you <laughs> didn't name son. your son. And my son. My son. I was, my family. I was about to. My knock wife you and son. If so you... let me say hi to Tia, my beautiful <laughs> wife, and Ethan. My super cool son, I love you guys. Yeah, I was about if he if he if he wasn't trained in MMA, I was about to knock him off that chair. Oh yeah. So. <laughs> but he caught himself. He yeah. caught himself. All right. <laughs> Catch y'all later.